Hey everybody, how you guys doing? So, I'm going to try to record another video here about philosophy, about Greek philosophy and the thought of the Eliatics um, from Elia. The uh, Elia? Elia? I am not there. I don't know how to pronounce it. But Parmenides and Zeno, who famously had the, the tortoise and the hare, which Lewis Carroll, who I like a lot and I'm going to be doing videos about here in a day or two because I got to do it before the 10th because uh, reasons, that essentially Parmenides and Zeno, the Eleatics, also Melissus, we will briefly mention. I am going to do this first video on Parmenides. This is a video about Parmenides and Greek thought. Parmenides is one of the three major pre-Socratic Greek philosophers. Uh, was the student of Xenophanes. Uh, Xenophanes we just talked about. And Xenophanes is not one of the th major three. The major three are Pythagoras, Heraclitus, and Parmenides. And Parmenides had a student and a follower by the name of Zeno, who was very famous for his paradoxes, which are designed to prove or what have you. It's questionable what's going on. We'll talk about that using his paradoxes to show that Xenophanes was right, that the human mind may or may not be capable of understanding truth itself without contradiction. Which we'll talk about. It's not clear what Parmenides and Zeno mean by this, but it is somewhat. So Parmenides was alive uh, around 510 to 450 BCE, other side of Jesus, um, over about two and a half thousand years ago. Born in Elia, Greek colony on the southern coast of today, Italy, near Croton, the place uh, the Pythagoreans set up shop. Parmenides was known as the founder of the Eleatic school from Elia, which is Elea, what have you, um, which like the Milesians. Um, and Zeno and Melissus were the school's second and third famous thinkers. Born of a wealthy family, Parmenides became known as an excellent orator and legislator, and he was known for leading an admirable life, and the phrase, a Parmenidean life, was apparently known by later Greeks as a noble existence of simplicity, morals, and discipline. No fun, though. Um, just morals and discipline. Xenophanes may or may not have taught Parmenides, but either way, he was clearly a major influence. Um, with Xenophanes, we were just talking about moments ago, maybe not for you, um, that he has a problem with having something moving, not moving, that moves and shakes all things. Now, mention that problem at the time. Please watch the Xenophanes video uh, if you would like to know more about that, and that is a good video to watch before this one, because... Parmenides seems to be arguing that, yes, everything moves and doesn't move, therefore we can't understand it. Or, perhaps an unmoving thing does move things and therefore we do understand it but it's contradictory or we don't understand it because the only way we could understand things is by terms of contradiction. One of the problems of one and many I like to main, uh, show people, people may have very easily back in the day before written culture said, problem of the one and the many. So this hand is one thing, right? But it's also many things, yes? Now, one thing, something that's one thing, is specifically not many things, and that it's unified. And something that's many things is specifically not one unified thing, and that it is many, yes? Contradictory-wise. And yet, what thing isn't one and many? What thing isn't light and dark? This is both light, but not uh, completely light. Dark, but not completely dark. We were talking about white complexion and whether and the Greeks not having that. Um, and the Thracian slave girls and other things. Um, and not calling themselves the Thracian slave girl white or any Ethiopians black. But if nothing is the lightest or the darkest thing, then everything is light and dark. If nothing is one or many, then things are both one and many. But how can things be light and dark if light is not dark and dark is not light. And how can things be one and many if things are all many and one and one and many? Well, Parmenides seems to be telling us that Xenophanes' problems is actually human problems. It seems. Although, again, we have to interpret this. The best interpretation I have is that Parmenides is saying whenever human beings do philosophy, hey, I'm trying to learn a living, they end up coming up with contradictions. They end up coming up with contrary understandings, and they can't help it. Before you say that's why people should do science rather than philosophy, here he would mean, of course, all art, science, and politics, and human understandings are composed of contradictions. In fact, Hegel, um, one of the more major German thinkers of the early 1800s, he was doing his ma major work in the early 1800s, says, if you have a truly scientific Christian mind, you will, if you believe him, Hegel, 
understand that all things are composed of contradictory opposites because Hegel was trying to make, make a Newton's pendulum out of everything. Hegel is well aware of Zeno and Parmenides, and he Hegel believes that Parmenides' dialogue, the Parmenides of Plato, is one of Plato's most important dialogues, because in there, Parmenides tells boy Socrates, we have already seen Socrates die in an earlier play, uh, play of Plato, which means we flash back, and Plato has us go to boy Socrates' life through many of his different plays, and he meets Parmenides and Zeno, and Parmenides tells him straight up, if you argue X and not X, Y and not Y, Z and not Z, such that there is and isn't gods, is and isn't a god, is and isn't mathematics, and if you do that every morning until night, you will be unstoppable, is what Parmenides tells Socrates, and then the thing kind of cuts off. We're not sure if there was supposed to be extra, but in the dialogues of Plato, some people like Hegel and some French thinkers believe the Parmenides is the greatest dialogue of Plato. The reason is because it happens to be Plato's most skeptical dialogue, where Plato, more than anywhere else, says, like Heraclitus, whom Plato hates, that you can look at things as contradictory opposites. Now, Parmenides and Plato may not like Heraclitus. They may be saying something slightly different, but they're not saying something entirely different. So what exactly Heraclitus and Parmenides and Plato are saying when they say things are opposite, but that's the objective truth, is many different shades of something. Um, but it is interesting to get into their thought because, again, you can find problems with psychology, modern thought, and ancient thought in these Greek philosophical pieces and theories. So, uh, Diogenes Laertius says Parmenides was taught by a Pythagorean named Emmaenius, I believe. Again, I didn't hear it from him. Parmenides seems to agree completely with Pythagoras' account of the universe, which we did not spend much time on because it gets a little esoteric and people don't know. But he strangely believes this is mere mortal opinion and illusion. Um, how reality seems to be, but Parmenides does say things are one, not many. So Parmenides actually says, if things appear to be many, that's an illusion. So actually, this hand, in a certain sense, is not moving. That's an illusion. All is one moment for Parmenides. So the motion and the manyness of this hand is an illusion to Parmenides. How? Um, he either means this is an illusion, or when I try to explain this, I can't explain this except by way of contradiction. Either of which is kind of fascinating. Um, the first one is a little more is a little stranger. Parmenides seems to be arguing that nothing ever truly moves, and there are no true divisions between anything. Kind of like the Indian Upanishads, Tatvamasi, that is you. There are no divisions between things, and there is thus no motion, no time. All of that is an illusion. So Parmenides obviously has a very strange part. Here he is a little bit like a little like Leibniz. That isn't a band name yet. Um, probably will never be. That Leibniz says we're all monads and it all is the illusion we're interacting, but when I shake your hand, actually that's just my private monad and your private monad setting up some weird hologram that makes it appear as if we are shaking hands, but actually none of that's real and we're sort of dots in space. Um, sort of small planets under themselves, sort of like Mormons um, might have in the afterlife. So oddly enough here, or 5% uh, nation, so oddly enough, Wu-Tang Clan, they're not Mormon, I guess, the uh, essentially here you have sort of a problem is so do things move or do they not really move uh, if they do really move then we can't explain it if they don't move we are living in an illusion and very much a dream things seem to move in time but like with leibniz that's just an illusion because and actually why because math and certainty funny enough uh, people like math so much as part of what they observe in reality. They sort of project that math has to be entirely true, therefore complete determinism, therefore possibility and chance and motion might be an illusion. Which is kind of looking at math, finding math so steady and regular that you figure change is actually, unlike math, wrong. Which <laughs> is a place you can take some of this stuff. In fact, again, if that doesn't say that should sound a little close to some cosmological theories of modern times. Um, and yeah, I don't know about all that. I don't know what creature was around to build a static hologram or what have you, but again, people say a lot of interesting things in modern times, probably because we have the same brains with similar psychology as the Indians and Chinese and other ancient philosophers were. Parmenides, as was saying, had a huge impact on Plato. Um, 
He, Plato reveres Parmenides, calls him in the sophist dialogue, our father Parmenides. Plato clearly hates Heraclitus and he likes Parmenides. That does not mean, although Heraclitus talks smack, it seems though possibly about Pythagoras because he says this guy was Einstein supposedly, but he thought he was a cucumber. Parmenides similarly seems to talk smack about Heraclitus, um, but... So it does seem one led to the other led to the other, and they're all critical of each other, but we don't know entirely, uh, given fragments of Parmenides and of other dialogues he is reported in, that what Parmenides exactly thought or if Plato would have agreed with Parmenides, Parmenides would have agreed with Plato and sided against Heraclitus. That's how he's reported to us. Would he, would have, would he have done that? Heraclitus oddly says all things move. Um, Parmenides actually says none do. Plato seems to believe very much there is a static form of the good that is perfect and universal and unmoving he doesn't necessarily entirely pin himself down completely on this though but like the unmoved mover of aristotle um and like the problems with um with that we've been talking about with anaximander and others there are problems anaxagoras xenophanes um parmenides his teacher possibly there are problems with having something static that does not move, um, that moves and interacts with things that move, but itself remains unmoving. That actually creates certain sorts of problems uh, with the theory. You could ask yourself, for instance, even gravity. I like uh, have often a, is gravity an unchanging constant? Uh, it, how would the universe bang and change into an unchanging constant? Like. It would be much more reasonable to assume, and I am not the modern cosmologist, so consult your modern cosmologist as you walk down the street. You know, put one foot in front of the other. Could gravity be an unchanging thing in a changing world? If you say that yes, that's, that gravity has to be a static perfect constant a la Newton, possibly before Einstein, that would make you a bit Parmenidean. By the way, Einstein himself considered himself to be somewhat Parmenidean. So Einstein did believe actually, in some sense... Uh, changes an illusion and was somewhat like Parmenides. That does not mean I believe that Parmenides or Einstein was right. In fact, I don't think that they're right, but I'm not Einstein about physics, so I'm not going to I'm going to tell you about the philosophy part. Um, I'm not going to tell you about the Newton and the Einstein. I'll let that be more so somebody else's subject. But yes, um, I can tell you who's like what and what that sort of seems to imply, and that's happened before in India, Greece, and China in interesting ways. It's again, in a certain sense, if gravity is part of the mortal world below, then gravity would have to be changing and moving. It could be very, very, very constant glacially, um, like a glacier seems to not move, but how can a moving thing produce an unmoving thing? Um, the cosmos produce unmoving gravity or something in time. I do like bringing this up to students because, again, I just perplex myself and others, and I gotta say, I, uh, no one needs to solve these problems for us to build rocket ships or do physics. People did not need to solve this problem to build pyramids or temples back in the day. They did it, um, and they debated these questions while pulling rocks and stones and weapons and everything else together, as we still do. Plato, though, is very into following Parmenides. He divides what it seems that Parmenides is just dividing static, perfect truth from completely the world of appearance and opinion. If he is, he may be actually saying it paradoxically, unlike Plato, in order to force us to realize that there is no objective truth and actually anything we call an objective truth like gravity or something, sort of like what I was just saying. He may be trying to force us by saying gravity is unchanging, therefore everything is an illusion. He may be trying to force us to admit something like unchanging gravity is itself human words and thus an illusion um, in that it is a static part as opposed to the moving stuff that falls with gravity. He may be trying to gravity falls and what have you. If gravity falls, then yes. Um, if not, if it's perfect, but other things fall according to gravity, that is odd because gravity itself does not move or change as it moves and changes and shakes things like uh, the mind of Xenophanes in the universe. So, um, Plato follows this very much. Is he right to do so? Open, interesting questions. We'll have a lot more time to talk about that in future videos. So like Heraclitus, we only have opening and fragments of Parmenides' work on nature. Once again, pretty much the same titles in Ophanes, Heraclitus, plenty of people use. It means my book on stuff, on nature. Um, Ereugen in the middle, around 900, wrote the Paraphision in Latin. Um, that would be on nature. Yet again, it's a, it's like somebody's encyclo, you know, somebody's physics and or psychology. Um, somebody's science, oh, stuff and the mind and the universe. 
So in the work, an unnamed goddess, this is again, people were writing uh, works in poetry and also prose, but putting a lot of gods and other things into it, um, that there is an unnamed goddess who instructs the narrator, Parmenides himself, who journeys from darkness to light, leaving the house of night for the light, accompanied by daughters of the sun in a chariot. The daughters pull back their veils from their heads, a gesture um, likely meaning enlightenment and revealing that there are many polytheistic daughters um, and they are revealing themselves progressively. Um, and yes, that, uh, that it's not only female deities, not male deities, but they are also, um, well, yeah, there's something like epiphany, which in the older meaning means that a god is revealing uh, themselves to you. Much like Gabriel and other things being the voice of God, being like, well, God's secret and silent and quiet and invisible, but I'm here to be the visible noisy part as voice saying yop uh, to all of that. So the word apocalypse actually also comes from revealing, uh, apoc a, a uncovering. Um, and Christianity and the Abrahamic religions with some roots in Greek philosophy, of course, and Greek culture has associated this with something like a revealing apocalyptic literature. Parmenides is thus called apocalyptic literature because he seems to be talking about cracking into the gods and then having everything revealed to you. Whether or not he is talking about the end of the world, it is apocalyptic literature because it is a rising into the heavens or a receding into the earth, which then reveals the true secrets of what is going on in the cosmos, either from above or from below, which is where the source of things coming downward or things coming upward would be from alternatively. So Parmenides, like the forking Y of Pythagoras, says there are two roads. One is the road of day, the way, and the other of night. The gates and doors in the sky. Left and right-handed paths, kind of, as already talked about with Pythagoras. So as Parmenides ascends into the sky, he leaves the house of night below to find the doors to be up in the sky, which doesn't make total sense, is a bit contradictory. The doors of good and bad, night, light and night are in the sky, but he leaves night below for light up above, which weirdly means the choice is up in the sky, but that's choosing the, the higher over the lower. Which does make sense, it's like you have the freedom to choose higher over lower and the doors up above, but why isn't the lower door down below? Um, that does seem to be a bit inconsistent, but again, um, we may not understand the words, we may not know another thing or two he is clearly saying here, or is left out, or I don't get it. Um, it's as best as I've heard experts say, though. So, the justice, the goddess DK, like Nike, Nike, um, with the shoes, is victory. Um, DK is the blind goddess holding the scales. Um, and she is, I don't believe actually she's always presented as blind, um, but she is said to be avenging, uh, according to Parmenides, implying that she allows the good through the door of day and pushes the bad through the door of night. This is very Parme uh, Pythagoras, if uh, Pythagoras believed in the forking Y, um, Sigma, that, uh, that's totally screwed in basically, is that Parmenides believes that there are forking paths. Pythagoras also believes there are forking paths. There is the path that is more steady, that leads to permanence. There is the path that leads to destruction. Um, Parmenides is picking up very much the Pythagorean why. Um, it's, uh, again, it's sigma or epsilon. I am so bad um, with the language and the skills. But yes, whatever the heck the Greek letter Y is, dangs it, um, is basically something like what Parmenides is seeing up in the sky. There is a way towards permanence. There is a way towards falling apart into many manyness, chaos, and disillusion. Probably not. It is something like a pharaoh permanent afterlife. For some, it seems or could be. But again, there is sort of like getting fed to the crocodile a la the Egyptian afterlife. There really isn't so much of a hell or torment as much as there is just destruction. You are destroyed. I believe that's also what modern Calvinists believe and other things like that. There are Christian denominations who believe, well, there's a heaven and then there is no hell because you are just gone. Um, something sort of like that seems to be what these guys are talking about. It also would be whether or not there's an afterlife involved. Stuff that's good remains solid. Stuff that's terrible, it falls apart. You know, like a poorly made bicycle. That's the way it works. So the daughters of the sun convince DK, justice itself. Heraclitus says justice herself is the workings of the seasons. That they eat each other alive and they go back and forth warring. Father uh, Heraclitus says war is the father of all. Justice is literally the endless battle of all things. Um, so the the revelatory sun daughters, solar daughters, I don't think that's a band name either, 
convince DK to open the doors with soothing words, and the chariot that Parmenides is riding in presumably flies through the door of day to meet with the goddess, which is either DK herself or some unnamed deity, which again could be a confusion of the text or not. Parmenides, departing from Homer and Hesiod, says that this goddess governs all things, that of all the gods she created love first, likely possibly Aphrodite, known to the Romans as Venus, she explains that though there is no reliance on the opinions of mortals, but that opinions and appearances are part of the larger whole which can be found on the road of and through the door of day, the light. Um, this does imply again, there's actually, uh, Parmenides talks like there is only the permanent, the impermanent is completely false, not real, but then he also talks, and Zeno and Melissa also talk as if it's paradoxically both, and we just can't understand it. So this is one in many in light and dark. You're just not going to get it with human judgments, which is almost mystical. We have to be driven upward into everything through the mystical ascent, which you also have here through the language of the gods. It needs to be revealed to us, because if I try to use logic and reasoning as a rationalist, I just come to contradictory conclusions about this. Hegel says yes, and then he thinks you need to move Allah with him and Marx to some other stage. Hegel was no Marxist, though. Um, but yes, uh, he was more of a conservative Republican dad um, and thinks, eh, this is pretty good. You know, final stage, it's Fukuyama, final stage of culture, everybody. Um, uh, and yet others would not. So the way of truth is described. Um, that uh, And differentiated from the way of opinions and appearance. Um, that's... It seems identical to Plato, and again, like the Pythagorean, why? Um, in naming things, marking them, we are the ones who separate and unify our reality in various ways. The lower way is quite identifiable as the position of Heraclitus. All things change, and they're all in flux. Parmenides sounds somewhat like Heraclitus in condemning his position, saying that those who say that being and non-being are the same and are not the same, and who say that the road of all things turns back on itself, are deaf and blind wanderers. Which Heraclitus actually says about people who don't realize all change. Um, Parmenides and Heraclitus are two dueling thinkers. They either are saying exactly the same thing from two different sides, or Heraclitus is saying all is change, there is no stability and permanence in existence. Um, that is decently an illusion. Permanence. This hand is constantly changing. That it is the same is an illusion of your eyes not noticing how quick, how slowly this changes, like the glacier. Parmenides seems to say the opposite, unless he's saying both like Heraclitus, that only there is permanence. This hand and everything else are stable forever. If you think this is changing and that things are moving around, that is the illusion. Either that or Parmenides saying is there's both an illusion. But again, it is very, Parmenides is a very strange thinker who is either completely opposed to Heraclitus saying all is change, or else thinks it's one and the same and somewhat of a paradoxical illusion to figure anything out. But if that's true, why is Heraclitus wrong rather than right? I have to tell you, I only make as much sense of this as I do right now, which is this. Um, there is, Parmenides would argue, um, not in Latin, ex nihilo nihil fit, um, from nothing comes nothing, um, ex, which is where we get ex nihilo. Um, in a certain way, some people have said the Big Bang comes out of nowhere, kind of, um, or have implied, oh, we, I actually had a student once say, we are agnostic about that. I'm like, we? Who's, you know, as, uh, wow. <laughs> Yakko from Animaniac says when uh, opening up the mouth of the queen, how many of you are there in there? You know, um, we believe in gravity altogether. It's like, wow, uh, how many people outside are believing in gravity right now? Is that all a we? Um, that essentially, because nothing can come from nothing, um, all non-being, Parmenides weirdly argues, and he's either trying to trick us and show how human reasoning is a trick, or else he is actually arguing human reason is real and he is showing that nothing can move. Either way, maybe both, that because nothing cannot give birth to anything, non-being cannot be. Um, non-being cannot arise out of something and something cannot arise out of nothing. This is rather a dualistic argument. Is that an illusion of reason being dualistic or not? So later Neoplatonists, Plato and his followers, who like Parmenides, basically say there are many types of non-being which exist as non-being in particular ways. But Parmenides actually says all types of non-being, which includes motion. If this isn't standing still as a kind of being in a certain sense, motion would be a kind of change in non-being as in not standing still. So standing still is real, but 
motion is change and thus is an illusion. The being of the hand is real. The non-being and impermanence of the hand, if this is all one moment in time and I am and you are, the impermanence of this hand is an illusion, which means all is, is not, isn't, any kind of way. This hand moves, this hand is a mortal hand, hello. All of that part of this, if Parmenides is saying what it sounds like he is saying somewhat, is an illusion. Oddly, again, like Leibniz, this means most of everything we see is just straight up illusion in life. Um, there is no reality there, in a certain sense. Which again makes Zeno talk like that cryptically and not say what he's also saying, and Melissus actually somewhat backtracks as the third and says, no, 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 he's talking more realistically like there is and isn't motion. And motion is somewhat real, but not really real. Which seems a bit more reasonable, but honestly, Parmenides and Zeno are talking like Zen. They do are a bit Zen, not entirely. They talk like Zen folks in that they're just screwing with you and telling you the wrong part, the wrongest part, as if it's true, in order to screw with you and turn your turn your mind inside out. They don't mean entirely what they mean. They do enough that they're telling you the weird, contradictory part first. It could be that as well. But Melissa seem, feels the need to backtrack and say, "No, no, 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 no. How would he believe that?" Um, so again, there's awareness amongst the Eleatics themselves that this is a strange position to be in, and certainly they're going out freaking out the squares, saying, oh, no, nothing can come from nothing, therefore this is an illusion. It's like people on the street would have been mystified, and they would have been pre you know, preaching this and trying to teach people in palaces, but also outside, etc. So what this would mean is that all differences between things, the fact that these two fingers are different, if you trace it down the way, they are the same. It's the same here with change and difference would have to all be illusion. Um, which, yeah, is quite remarkable. So, unlike physicists, Parmenides is saying all change and all motion are illusion and fate. Time, a false. <laughs> Misread that. Time is an illusion, an idea somewhat in Indian thought, some. Um, Parmenides says if all things are moving, then they must move into nothingness or void. If this hand can move then it's moving into nothingness. Because if there was being, it couldn't be, it couldn't move. So there has to be non-being for it to move through. But because non-being can't exist, because it can't arise out of anything, this is known as the Eleatic Challenge. There are many, including Plato and Aristotle, who react to this and have different answers because this answer isn't good enough for everybody. In fact, it's not good enough for me, and I'm part of everybody, that this would mean that this can't move if it can't move through non-being. But watch. You know, this is actually similar to... Lisa Simpson says, what is the sound of one hand clapping to Bart Simpson? And Bart's like this. She's like, no, Bart, it's an unanswerable riddle. He's like, Lise, check it out. You know, it's like, hey, check it out, kids. Motion is possible. It's like, yeah, it strikes a Barkley for whom the town I'm in right now is mispronounced. He fa uh, said that all his mind is, uh, there is no material reality. There's only the imagination of God. And, uh... Uh, Samuel Johnson, after leaving church with a guy and hearing that theory, walked up to a big rock in the courtyard, kicked it, and said, I refute it thus, although the rock could be in his mind, you know. So, either all this is a heck of an illusion, and you and I are absolutely the same and unchanging, or else Parmenides is talking tricky and zen-like in order to screw with us and tell us things, as Zeno, his student, is, that are designed to trip us up and show us how foolish reasoning is which may mean we should be open to the mystical and be open to the light and not really try to control it with reason would be the kind of skeptical mystical answer here. That if you try to reason, you can't. There are, uh, against the Mutazilites, Al-Ghazali in the Islamic world specifically argued, no, philosophers are wrong, reason is terrible, therefore I'm a mystic. I am opening myself up to the light emotionally and irrationally because... If you try to reason these things, you end up coming up with stupid arguments about how math is completely real or motion is impossible or something like that, and that has contradictions and problems, kicks cans down the road to other problems and other courts, essentially. Royal or, you know, uh, sports or otherwise. So both Parmenides and Heraclitus do believe all is one, and this is a supreme one without difference, and that this is above all, and then seems to, at least, move as all. Heraclitus allows for it to be unchanging insofar it's the continuous change. Heraclitus and Parmenides are both supposed to be uh, influenced or taught by Xenophanes. So to resolve the paradox of Xenophanes is infinite, Heraclitus says the stability is cons consistent change and instability. That unless you stir your body with your heart and lungs, that you fall apart if you stop moving. Parmenides sort of says this, uh, the opposite. You can't really be many different moving parts because actually there has to be some sort of stability to you and all things. 
So the one is a continuous thing, is indivisible, and does not have many parts or differences in itself, according to Parmenides. It seems, he says, as mentioned. He compares being to a sphere without parts and continuous along the surface. Some say this means he's like Leibniz. He believes in a monad or a grand one. Others say this is just a metaphor. Heraclitus was the first to use the word logos uh, for order speech of the gods that orders things. But he does believe this is constant chaotic change. Order is constant chaos for Heraclitus because darkness is light and light is darkness. As Heraclitus says, it has not occurred to many, and it certainly doesn't occur to Parmenides, that day and night are one and the same, although he sort of said exactly that, Parmenides has, and that actually darkness and light are just two sides of the... Like hot and cold don't separate at some point. They are a continuous spectrum. For Parmenides, light and dark are two completely separate things, and in a certain sense, darkness must be therefore impossible. Um, and all is light, is what Parmenides seems to be saying. So yes, uh, let's see here. We are going to get to Zeno, and I'm going to stop this video because I'm going to do a different video on Zeno and cover him in another thing. This is now a half hour long, which is a perfect length of time. But we will finish this out here by saying that scholars very much agree that Parmenides', Parmenides is goddess, lots of S's, describes Pythagorean cosmology and then says this is the opinion of mere mortals. It's very like Plato. He sort of is Parmenides. Plato, if you like Plato at all, or you hate him, Plato is trying to wrestle with, he doesn't like Heraclitus, he doesn't like people in the cave thinking all the shadows and change, but he doesn't seem to know whether or not it ultimately is Pythagoras and math is totally real, which means things are one, two, three, four, five, like what an idiot would have on their luggage, according to Spaceballs Mel Brooks, or, if that is not the case, um, then all is one and math itself and Pythagoras and the sardine and the cucumber are an illusion. And Plato seems to want to have his cake and eat it too. I will talk more about this with Plato specifically. Plato seems to want a totem pole. Heraclitus, Pythagoras being like math and ratios are rational and real, but then he kind of has a special place for our father Parmenides who art in the unmoving because in a certain sense, Plato wants it to mystically be the case that there is objective truth that is math, and it's real, 2 plus 3 truly does equal 5, but then he also wants to believe Parmenides and believe but those are human conceptions and actually nothing is totally, totally separate, darkness and motion or uh, illusion to the god, him, her, itself. Which means, weirdly, he has to sort of be taking a position like Parmenides. It's sort of like math is totally real, but it's also like math is a human illusion and there are no differences in the light and between things. And honestly, I'm just going to leave that the way it is. Um, this is known as the Eleatic Challenge, as already mentioned. Zoroastrians believe Ahriman, the evil spirit or god, some of the first monotheists of Persia, polluted the world in the beginning, known as the lie or the drug. Um, some suggest the Persian druj, um, which is spirit or deceiving force, uh, mean, is similar in etymology to our word drug. Again, others question those etymologies, and all of them. Um, like Heraclitus, Parmenides shares a decently monotheistic cosmos with the Zoroastrians, and he does say logos and order is something that seems to move downward into our lives, and there's a goddess talking to him, moving her lips somehow, or not. Maybe that's an illusion. Parmenides' claim that all change is illusion then gets known, as stated now here a few times, the Eleatic Challenge. It's not really what they would call it, but it's what we call it um, in talking about the Greeks. Many thinkers like Plato and Aristotle are going to come along and try to argue about this and whether or not Parmenides knows what the heck he's talking about. Of course, many are going to say there is motion, but how? Which means they are going to Xenophanes, possibly Parmenides' teacher, says, oh, there's an unmoving mind that moves and shakes all things. Parmenides, Anaxagoras, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and others are going to have one heck of a time, and I do love how the most intellectual of thought boils down to very simple spatial metaphors a lot of the time, very simple human problems, which is why we can all talk about the deepest of philosophy if it's put in human words and somewhat taken out of the clouds of academy and put in front of people in real simple terms, Indian, Greek, Chinese thought, such that we can see how we're still very much dealing with the same psychology, new stage of technology, new stage of cultures, and yet we very much are a lot of the same. Um, the Eleatic Challenge is something that how can there be one static, unmoving reality and yet you cannot see anything in reality that is static and unmoving? If 2 plus 3 equals 5 is a static objective truth, how would that come out of the Big Bang and or whatever the heck came before the Big Bang and a bunch of change in motion? 
It's a very good problem. In fact, it's a problem I wrestle with students all the time about whether or not math is absolutely real or is just human conceptions with hands. I tend to be the latter and a hardcore Wittgensteinian pragmatist. As of this moment, I do not know of any single person alive. I do like mentioning these kind of things, and I do not mean this proudly. I mean this as a human being encouraging my fellow human beings to think. At this moment, I do not know a single person alive who could answer the Eliadic challenge enough such that they could say, no, math is statically real. 2 plus 3 always equals 5 perfectly, and yet all things change, and I've never seen two things that are never not in slight motion. Now that itself, like with an unchanging gravity, is a very odd thing to try to figure out because it actually has some of the pieces here of the Eleatic Challenge. And no, I do not mean Parmenides was the first to think of it and do it. Now we have to have had him. He obviously influenced us, but we have these psychological problems of if things are completely stable facts unmoving and perfectly objective, how do we see them as subjective and in motion? which is still the problem of subjectivity and objectivity long after Hegel wildly open, such that postmodernists now, of course, distrust much Hegelese. Um, but that is a problem for modern thought, and I'm going to get to making those videos next semester, actually, about Hegel and others, and I hope to make ones that follow this. I'm going to be doing Greek philosophy videos this semester and next semester, and Buddhist philosophy videos this semester. Next semester will be more Asian philosophy and modern European philosophy, which is excellent, because between the four, I will crank out most of the videos I would ever want to make on my lectures on a lot of this stuff. So, Demo Democritus called the laughing... Democritus was called the laughing philosopher by Juvenal, and the atomists, who we will get into soon, try to resolve this paradox with atoms. Technically, an atom is no longer an atom because an atom is something without cut. Once you split the atom, they can't be atoms anymore. We just fossilize the language. Like elements. Once you break basic elements into different parts, they can't be the basic elements anymore. We just keep the words atom and element around for things that technically should not be titled that anymore. Once you split the atom, once you have further sub-elements or what have you, or sub-parts of elements. Though that should not be the language, it just is. No one cares. Um, this is, again, science is not a perfect unified system. It's just human cultures that, that keep the word atom around, tell you now you can't divide by zero, you know, or something like that, sort of, now that we have this mechanics, and it's somewhat of a toss-up with this stuff. But essentially, atoms were originally, for Indian and Greek thought, little stabilities that do not change and cannot get cut, in India and Greece, simultaneously, people still debate which Indian or Greek thinker came up with this idea first. Unchanging, perfect, static things were not born in time. Always have been for the atomists. There's just been atoms rattling around forever, and that's how you would have being be stable in the void. And notice this requires a void and non-being in it. So Parmenides, they would, the atomists answer the Eleatic challenge, well, there is void, but non-being and being never mix. It's just being moves around within non-being. That is no longer our atomic theory. In fact, our atomic theory is atoms are composed of moving parts. The original whole reason for atomic theory is to, in Greece anyway, have an answer partly to the Eleatic challenge. How can you have static being of this hand if this hand seems to move and be many? Well, because it could be composed of unmoving, unchangeable things. Well, technically they move around, but as far as their own internal components which don't exist, atoms to themselves, in relation to each other, do move internally, they are uncuttable and unmovable and do not have parts. Which, of course, creates another whole set of problems, kicking the can down the road for future physicists to worry about or anything like that. So, Einstein in, believed in block time. That while we perceive as moving all of... that we think we are moving, but actually, of course, Einstein believed, and there are others after Einstein who do not believe Einstein. Um, in fact, chaos theory kind of suggests in some ways, I've gotten into arguments and that is not my subject, but knowing about it as a common person, in certain ways, chaos theory, Mandelbrot, fractals can account for, in ways, but need not, that things are somewhat chance and somewhat order. I have had somebody tell me that's not what chaos theory says. Chaos theory actually backs up the idea there's absolutely fate and order. I have had a student tell me that. I don't get that entirely. But here I'm just going to actually say I've heard scientists and mathematicians interpret these things in completely opposite ways, and that means we can function while theoretically thinking in completely opposite ways about it. Um, technically, Einstein believed in Parmenides. He, Einstein says this is actually one static moment in time, and to you and I and me trying to get the camera equipment to work, that is all very much an illusion. The philosopher of science Popper, who taught 
the more skeptical Fire Robin, who says uh, science is anything goes and whatever works, famously, Popper called Einstein Parmenides as an insult because he would not be Einstein, uh, because, <laughs> because he would not be, I almost said, I, I was going to say Einstein enough. I was thinking Newton. Einstein was too Newtonian for others after who are more relativistic about time and change um, and non and disorder with chaos theory and fractal geometry and other such, as was saying, that is controversial. Um, Popper insults um, Einstein for being too much Parmenides. Um, Einstein was a determinist. He famously said, God doesn't play dice with the universe. That actually makes, uh, if, and Einstein does seem to believe there is a mind of all of this. So in other words, Einstein is a heck of a Parmenidean, um, actually, or was, uh, you know, because he is no more immortal unless all this is an unchanging moment, which Einstein and this hand are one and the same and static and permanent. Um, Again, chaos theorists and others later. I have a book called uh, that I read a long time ago, bought in college, called "God Plays Dice." And of course, you can believe in God and believe in chaos, uh, or believe uh, metaphorically it's all something like a god and that it is chaos. So you can go either way here, and that would be far more Heraclitus, um, whom Plato hates, and Parmenides also seems to follow suit. Well, was first, and Plato follows suit in hating Heraclitus, like. Parmenides. Yes. Well, that is that. Um, that's Parmenides for now. That is a good 40 minute video. Um, so I will do Zeno next. And yes, much happiness, everybody. And I hope you all are good and well. And again, try to change and develop in a static, unchanging world, politically, economically, or what have you. Much happiness.